Hi, this is Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. Hope you're doing well today. You know, in some of my videos, I've used the expressions ad hominem, red herring, straw man, or guilt by association to describe certain debate tactics. And I thought it might be a good idea to go over these expressions and what they mean. In the world of debate, these are called logical fallacies. That means that they're arguments that don't follow a logic-based path. Debaters are discouraged from committing logical fallacies and presenting their arguments, but in the real world, these fallacies are used all the time. In fact, marketing loves to use them for one main reason. They work. Most people don't think logically. They think emotionally. They make decisions based on their feelings rather than on facts and reason. And marketers know this. That's why they use ads that push the consumer's buttons by showing puppies and kids and soldiers and flowers rather than numbers, facts, and charts. But when you're making a case in a theological or philosophical discussion, logical fallacies can hurt your case because they can make you seem desperate or that you're more concerned about getting a reaction from people than you are about proving your point with facts and reason. Now, before we discuss logical fallacies, let's talk a bit about sophistry. Sophistry is the art of persuasion. The goal of sophistry is to get the other guy to see things the way that you do, or the way that you want him to see them. Courtroom attorneys use sophistry. It's how they sway jurors. Politicians use it too. It's how they get votes. But the goal of philosophy and theology is to find the truth. If you're really focused on finding the truth, you're not going to employ the tactics of attorneys or politicians. You're going to appeal to reason. The word sophist means wise person. It's where we get the word sophisticated. The original sophists were intellectuals who taught the art of rhetoric in Athens during the days of Socrates. In that day, sophistry was essentially the same as rhetoric. But these days, sophistry is usually used in reference to manipulative forms of rhetoric. Sophistry was very important to the ancient Greeks because their democratic system determined justice via debate. So experts in rhetoric or sophistry were always in demand. Socrates, being a philosopher, had little use for the sophists because, as I stated earlier, the goal of philosophy is truth not persuasion. Within sophistry, several logical fallacies are employed. First, there's the straw man argument. Now, what is a straw man argument? Well, have you ever seen a scarecrow? Many of our younger viewers may not have spent much time on a farm, but very often farms create a fake man to scare the crows away from the food that's growing. Crows are kind of dumb, and they don't know a fake man from a real man. Now, these scarecrows, as you probably know, are made out of straw. So, even if the scarecrow is six feet tall and stout, if you walk up to it and punch it, is it going to punch you back? Of course not. It's not real. But what if you were to walk up to a strapping young man who is about six feet tall and stout and start punching him? Is he going to punch you back? Absolutely. So, you see... It's much easier to defeat a fake man made out of straw than it is to defeat a real man. And that's the idea behind the straw man argument. You misrepresent your opponent's view in order to make it easier to defeat. For example, a person might say that Christians believe in following the Bible, and so that means that they want to create a theocracy with the church running the government. Then they could speculate about how horrible it would be for the country to be run as a theocracy, taking away all of our rights, locking up unbelievers, etc. Now, nobody wants the church running the government, of course. But if they can make people think that you do, then they can probably turn them against you with their straw man tactic. Then there's guilt by association. This is a tactic where an association is claimed or implied with a sinister figure. For example, Hitler used censorship. He burned books critical of the Nazis in an effort to maintain support for his party and rule. Does this make all censorship bad? 
Of course not. Most people don't want to see nudity or hear profanity on TV. And that's why the networks have decency standards. But sometimes you'll hear people who promote a reasonable amount of censorship referred to as Nazis. That's guilt by association. Then there's the ad hominem attack. Ad hominem is Latin for to the man. It means you attack your opponent's intelligence or character rather than focusing on his or her argument. For example, your opponent is arguing for a lower top marginal tax rate in the interest of encouraging savings and investment in order to stimulate the economy. Rather than providing evidence that shows how it won't accomplish what he claims it will, you simply accuse him of supporting tax cuts because he and his buddies are rich and greedy and they want to pay less in taxes. That's an ad hominem attack. You make it about him rather than about his position in the debate. Next, we have the red herring tactic. A red herring is a response that has nothing to do with the topic of debate. It's believed that smoked herring would emit a strong odor after they turned red, and that odor was often used to throw hunting dogs off the trail of a rabbit or a squirrel or whatever they were chasing. Therefore, a red herring is something to divert attention from the real issue being discussed. For example, a politician gets caught in a scandal. When asked about the details, he says, I don't think the American people are concerned about these things. They want us to focus on helping to build a better future for our children, blah, blah, blah. He wants to change the subject under the guise that his personal scandal isn't that important. That's a red herring. Another logical fallacy is the appeal to authority. This is when you suggest that some well-known figure takes this position, so it must be right. An example of this would be athlete endorsements. When you see an Olympic star on a box of cereal, that's an appeal to authority. When you see a celebrity endorsement of a political candidate, that's an appeal to authority. After all, Barbara Streisand knows so much more about how to run a country than us regular people do. The appeal to authority tactic is often used in the realm of science regarding the origin of life or the origin of the universe. Surely these people with doctorates are right and the Bible is wrong. Man evolved over a period of millions of years because Neil deGrasse Tyson said so. This completely overlooks the fact that science has rejected many of the views that science previously held and considered facts in the past. Then there's begging the question. This is one of the most misunderstood expressions in the world of logical fallacies. We often hear it used in the context of prompting a question, as in, she said that her boss was guilty of sexual harassment, but she never filed a complaint in the 10 years that she worked for him, which begs the question, if he was so bad, why didn't she leave or file a complaint? But that's not really what begging the question means. It doesn't mean prompting the question. Begging the question is a logical fallacy where your conclusion is contained in your premise. For example, you say, everybody's going there because it's so popular. Or, he's the best man for the job because he's the most qualified. If everybody is going somewhere, it's because of a certain attraction that place has, which is why it's so popular. If he's the best man for the job, it's because he has more experience, or a better education, or a better skill set, etc. Those skills are what make him the most qualified. Then there's the argument from ignorance fallacy, or ad ignorantium in Latin. That's seen when somebody insists that you prove their assertion to be false. The burden of proof is always on the one making the claim. You can't claim that there's life on Mars and then insist that it's true until I prove that it's not. That's not how it works. When a criminal is put on trial, the prosecution always has the burden of proof. The defense doesn't have to prove that the accusation isn't true. The only exception to this rule, of course, 
is with the IRS. With them, you're always presumed guilty until you prove that you're innocent. Then there's anecdotal evidence. That's when you use a story you've heard to support your premise rather than going by a mutually accepted reference or standard. I hear this one a lot, especially when apologists are trying to tell you how much damage has been done by this or that group. My Uncle Joe told me about a Pentecostal church where they bite the heads off of chickens. You better stay away from those churches. Anecdotal evidence is not real evidence. That's why they don't allow hearsay into testimony in court. Then there's the false choice fallacy. This is where there are only two choices presented, and you either have to choose one or the other. In reality, we often have a range of choices, and issues aren't as simple as black and white. There are often many shades of gray as well. For example, I heard a minister the other day saying that Jesus' admonition to deny ourselves does away with the idea of having health and prosperity. That's a false choice. Job was a righteous man, and he was extremely blessed. Solomon was extremely blessed, because when God told him to ask for anything he wanted, he asked for wisdom rather than riches or the death of his enemies. Joseph of Arimathea was wealthy, and he was a follower of Jesus who provided his burial tomb. You can be a devoted believer who lives righteously in dedication to the Lord and still experience God's blessings. Another fallacy is moral equivalence. This is similar to the guilt by association fallacy. A good example of this fallacy is comparing the enforcement of immigration laws with the Holocaust. Every country has immigration laws and for good reason. It's a way of keeping unwanted weapons, drugs, criminals, and diseases out of your country in order to protect its citizens. Six million Jews were said to have perished in the Holocaust. There is no moral equivalence between the enforcement of immigration laws and genocide. The hasty generalization fallacy is when you form a conclusion with far too little data to form any accurate conclusion. For example, I see naked women in Brazil on TV. Nudity must be commonplace in Brazil. Actually, they allow partial nudity during their carnival festival in Rio de Janeiro, but that's about it. Another example would be, all preachers care about is money. I see these rich preachers on TV with their expensive planes and their million dollar homes. Actually, 99.9% .9 of preachers don't have a plane or live in a mansion. In fact, one third of the churches in the U.S. have part-time pastors. So much for they're only in it for the money. Another fallacy is the false cause. This is when you make a wrong assumption about the cause of a certain effect. For example, at one time, fruit flies were thought to come from rotting meat. In 1859, the French scientist Louis Pasteur disproved spontaneous generation, the belief that fruit flies simply emerged from rotting meat rather than the process of reproduction that all other life forms come from. Now that's an extreme example because at the time so little was known about fruit flies and larvae, and it certainly appeared to most people that the fruit flies just spontaneously sprang from rotting meat. A simpler example might be when an athlete wears a different kind of underwear and has a great game. So from that point on, that's his lucky underwear. This isn't an exhaustive list by any means, but these are the most commonly used logical fallacies in my opinion, and by becoming familiar with them, hopefully you can understand what I'm referring to in my videos and recognize these tactics in the commentary from opponents of what we believe. Thanks for watching.